All right, I just finished watching Quadruple U DC. It is mostly a disappointment, okay? I'll be honest. Tons of analysts and leakers were way off on this one because there was no new hardware. That's what you need to know from the beginning. And I didn't get much of what I wanted, but there was still some things I'm happy about. So it's an overall mixed bag for me. Without further ado, let's begin. The funniest part about this event is how FaceTime basically stole the show. I think out of all the announcements they've made, FaceTime is where uh, most of the progress and most of the day-to-day -day difference will be made. But just from the beginning, some good news is that every device that received iOS 14 will also be receiving iOS 15, which kind of surprised me. The iPhone 6S, which came out in 2015, will be getting software updates into 2022. And every iPad that was updated last year will still get updates this year. So the iPad Air 2 will be getting eight years of software support on a $500 device. That's just amazing. But regardless, anyway, so FaceTime now supports a grid view, so you don't have to live with that floating bubble mechanism all the time. It supports spatial audio as well. Apple introduced a new feature called SharePlay, which allows you to share your screen with other people in the FaceTime call, which we've been asking for for so long, so thank you. We can listen to music and watch TV shows through SharePlay as well. Bringing spatial audio to FaceTime is weird, though because they said it'll sound like they're coming from the place on the screen you're talking to them on even though it's kind of a small screen i could see myself turning that off it sounds kind of weird but the most bizarre part is they are now opening up facetime via links so you'll be able to just send a facetime link to someone even if they're on an android phone or a windows laptop they'll be able to join the call it's still encrypted but technically now facetime works on pcs and android phones which is kind of crazy they brought portrait mode to the facetime front facing camera which is also interesting to me as well because that means portrait mode video is technically possible but i don't think it's available within the camera app it's only available when you're doing facetime calls which is kind of trippy and they talked about the different mic modes so you can isolate your voice and it will kind of automatically mute all background noise and isolate exactly where your voice is coming from although the demo made it sound kind of peaking so it might not work flawlessly but but still, audio should sound a lot better now. They were also hyping up a lot of different iMessage changes with all the quadruple UDC advertising, but pretty much the only noticeable difference to me was when you send like tons of photos to people, they will now be in a stack instead of like a giant wall of photographs. Now you can flip through a bunch of pictures at once and they'll also show up within the photos app if someone texted you a big bunch of them. So it'll be a bit easier to track down your pictures within the photos app. And they also talked about this new focus feature, which is is also going to be available across all the operating systems today. Most of the stuff I am talking about here is kind of going to be applied to iPad OS and Mac OS and watch OS, but focusing allows you to prioritize which apps can notify you and which apps can't. So you'll be able to specifically specialize like, okay, only work apps can talk to me right now, or you can switch it to just my personal apps and mute kind of my work related apps, or just go into reading mode or driving mode where you don't really get notified by anything. But the focus feature seems cool and it's synced across all of your Apple devices. So if you applied it on your iPhone, it will impact your iPad and Mac. And selecting a focus will notify people if they're trying to text you that, hey, I have notification silence right now. So even if you text someone, they will see that you probably will not be able to get to them right away and it won't notify them if they have do not disturb on. But apparently there's like an extra additional way for you to go past that and say, hey, this is an emergency. Please do notify this person if something is really going on. They redesigned notifications a little bit so that they prioritize messages from people and they show their faces more clearly. They also have this notification summary option, which kind of correlates what notifications are most relevant to you at the time of day. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to be able to tell what notifications I do and don't care about. I'm the type of person to just kind of turn off notifications on apps I don't care about. But now if you leave notifications on for everything, it should be pretty simple to figure out what is good and what isn't. I also really appreciate the updates they brought to Safari. They've redesigned it across the iPad, Mac, and the iPhone, and they've brought a lot of the tab functionality to the bottom of the app so it's a lot easier to switch between apps than having to reach to the very top select the tabs icon and then see all your tabs and click one now you can just kind of swipe between them as if they're applications which is kind of cool and they brought safari extensions to both the iphone and the ipad and i know a lot of people that were asking for extensions on ipad os so i'm glad it finally got that and they also brought some tinkering to the wallet app i was really excited to see because i've always wanted to have my driver's license embedded into the wallet app so i don't have to bring my wallet with me anymore. And now, thankfully, they're actually supporting that. It's not going to work in every state at first. So check 
check with the area where you live in to see if this is actually legal, but they do now support it directly from the wallet app and it'll use NFC and it'll tell you exactly what information is going to be stored on that card. But yeah, you should be able to just through the camera app in your phone, be able to add your driver's license to your phone, which is great for me because that means I won't have to carry my wallet around with me if California is okay with digital driver's licenses. I'm not sure if they are. Let me know on Twitter. They updated the Maps app as well to be a bit more immersive and have this redesigned driver interface to give you a 3D view of what lanes and what exits you're going to be taking. And it's very cool looking. It works with night mode as well and gives this kind of ambient lighting to the cities you're looking at. But so far, I guess it's only working in about seven major cities. So it's going to be a while before it probably gets to your area. They're bringing some new transit features as well as this ability to just kind of open the camera app, look around some buildings, and it automatically is able to detect where you are and give you augmented reality directions, which definitely looks like it would be more useful on augmented reality glasses, but those are a few years away. But seeing it through the iPhone is pretty cool as well. Through the Photos app, they also have live text, which I thought was pretty interesting. You'll be able to kind of point your camera at different objects that have text and it will automatically be able to read them. So if there's a phone number on a sign, you can point your camera at that number and call it directly. I could think of a ton of situations where that's helpful. I'm sure this has probably been a thing on Android for a while, but now that it's brought to iOS and it's going back on devices as far back as 2015, that's why even though a lot of these features may not seem like exclusive iOS features and they may have been on Android for a long time, they're all coming to much more devices because the iOS adoption rate is much better than that than the Android adoption rate. And there's not going to be a ton of Android phones from 2015 that are going to be getting software updates into 2022. Whereas with Apple, we can say, yes, even iPhones that were sold way back then will be getting these new features, which is pretty awesome. They talked a lot, and I mean a lot about health and tracking your walking speeds. And I was just kind of laughing at how they were measuring walking stability and how you need to train how to sit and stand correctly. I'm sure it's useful to some, but it was just kind of funny how much depth they go into on how exactly you're walking and with consenting people in your family, you can now share your health data with them. So if you have older grandparents in your family and you want to keep track on them, you'll be able to see if they fell or if their heart rate rose too high. It might be a little bit too much information. I know my grandma would probably get tired if we knew every time her heart rate went up, but we do care about them. It is important to keep track of their health. So allowing that option is now cool. They even went into details on how you'll be able to share your passwords with those trusted contacts if you are to die. So yeah, Apple's even putting in features for if you die and family members want to have access to your passwords and photos and stuff, they'll be able to. Not something a lot of us think much about, but that is something that probably happens fairly regularly. They also introduced this new service called iCloud Plus, but it's probably not what you're thinking. So basically it's built into anybody who's already paying for an iCloud package. So iCloud Plus, I don't believe is included with the five gigs of free storage but even if you pay for the 99 cent tier of 50 gigs, you get iCloud Plus, which sounds kind of like a VPN, except you can't really select where you want to be registered in the world. It is mainly putting all of your web browsing and all of your cloud interactions through a private relay. You can hide your email and it supports more HomeKit video pass through than before. So basically it gives you a lot more privacy control without having to pay for an additional VPN. So it's not like a whole separate tier, all different from iCloud storage options. Even though it's called iCloud Plus, it's coming to anybody who pays for iCloud today. So kind of weird phrasing. I don't know why they don't just say it's new features coming to iCloud, but the weather app got some redesigns where you can see a lot more information on hourly forecasts and satellite imagery. Siri is actually able to work offline now, which I'm really happy about because you can control a lot of stuff even if you're not connected to the internet. For the longest time, Siri has always required an internet connection and that was really annoying to me, especially if you're in an area with bad service or no Wi-Fi and you just want to do basic stuff like turn on the flashlight or open the camera app. And now that is all done locally instead of on a server, which absolutely makes it a lot more private. And the fact that even your older devices will be capable of doing that offline now is really cool. It's not some just exclusive to the A14 chip feature or anything like that. iPadOS 15, however, I have to say really, really disappointed me because I've been saying for months now with all of this incredible and amazing hardware they put in here, they needed the software to take better advantage of what's inside. We've got 16 gigs of RAM in these things. We've got Thunderbolt ports. We've got the insane power of the M1 chip. And yet iPadOS prevents us from taking advantage of so much of this hardware. And pretty much we just got uh, widgets on the home screen, um, some tinkered multitasking capabilities. You still can't run apps in a floating window. You can still only run two applications at a time, despite having eight to 16 gigs of RAM. They still limit it to only two. It's just easier now to select
select what apps you want to split view in multitasking, which I, I guess is an improvement. And I'm glad that you can finally place widgets anywhere on the home screen. I'm just confused as to why it took Apple a year to do that. They probably should have had that ready last year to go alongside iOS 14. But yeah, now in any app you're using, there's these three dots at the top and you press those and you can decide if you want it to be in side view or split view and you can access the home screen really quickly to bring up those apps. It's slightly better, I guess, because you don't have to just be accessing apps in the dock. And even from the multitasking view, you can slide an app on top of another and have them in split view. It's an improvement. It's just nowhere near taking advantage of the insane hardware that's in the iPad itself. And I did not see any updates for pro applications, which I know we've been asking for for years. I did not see any updated video codecs, which it's still shocking to me that Apple's own ProRes video codec is still not compatible with iPad OS, which is kind of frustrating because, you know, Apple designed that video codec. We have the M1 chip here. We have a Thunderbolt port, so much capable hardware. And yet they're like, eh, we can't support that type of high resolution video. And we're not going to give you Final Cut or Vlogic or any of that stuff. And Swift Playgrounds did get an update. So if you're doing some basic app editing, you can actually now submit those applications to the App Store, but it's still not fully fledged Xcode, which is a bit of a bummer. They did bring the app library to the iPad, which is also something a lot of people were shocked that didn't get last year. Now it finally did. So they're still kind of playing catch up. And there's a new quick note feature, which allows you to instantly drop links or live text from photos or maps directly into your note as you're writing with them with the Apple Pencil. And those little quick notes will show up on the iPhone and the Mac after you write them on the iPad itself, which is kind of neat. The new Safari redesign with all the tabs at the top, I think is going to be pretty divisive. I'm kind of cool with it. I think it looks pretty clean and I think I could get used to it in time, but I could tell a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with removing a lot of options. And some people are very, very comfortable with how they use Safari and the fact that that's all going to be rearranged now with Mac OS Monterey and iPad OS 15 is probably going to tick some people off. But basically the whole menu bar tries its best to blend in with the website you are using, which is kind of neat. Again, it does support extensions now, which a lot of people are asking for. So that's probably an appreciated upgrade. But ultimately, other than the stuff I've already talked about, there really wasn't much else brought to iPadOS. It honestly feels like they spent more time on health features than iPadOS, which kind of bums me out because I guess health is important, but there's so much untapped hardware here. And ultimately, I know that I really shouldn't be too disappointed at Quadruple UDC not having hardware because it's supposed to be a developer conference and software is the main focus. But iPadOS is, I think, what was limiting the hardware the most. And after this event, it still feels like the hardware is not being truly taken advantage of. And they really didn't do anything at this event to change iPadOS to take advantage of the amazing hardware it now has. When it comes to macOS Monterey, they actually did drop support for a surprising amount of Macs. So the first generation 2015 12-inch MacBook does not get support for Monterey. Luckily, my iMac Pro does, but for the MacBook Pro, you need the early 2015 version or later. Same with the MacBook Air, early 2015 and later. When it comes to the iMac, you need the late 2015 version and later, but still the trash can Mac Pro is supported. And when it comes to the 12 inch MacBook, you're gonna need one from 2016 or later to get support. So quite a few Macs were actually dropped there. The coolest feature by far for me with Mac OS Monterey is the universal control. So now Apple is allowing you to put your iPad and Mac near each other and you can use the same keyboard and mouse to switch over to the iPad and be controlling it from the same keyboard and mouse you control your Mac from. And you can even go from Mac to Mac to share files and control both of them. There's not a ton of situations I could imagine myself wanting to move files that are locally stored on the iPad to the Mac, especially if they were large files, because that would probably take a while to transfer. But just being able to see someone go from using their Mac with a mouse and then suddenly switch over to using the iPad with the same mouse, that was pretty neat. And I could see myself utilizing that a lot just for basic iPad OS navigation. They also let you now control your Mac via AirPlay. So if you wanted to play music off your iPhone and kind of turn your iMac into a HomePod, you can now access it from the AirPlay menu. Same thing with like screen sharing. If you have something on your iPhone and you want to cast it to a big iMac display, you do it through AirPlay now. And also the weird thing about this multi-device support with universal control is that Apple is saying there's no setup required. You just put the devices near each other and they suddenly start doing all this, which is pretty weird. They are finally bringing Siri shortcuts to the Mac now. So if you want to do more automation and then you don't want to do it through Automator, now you can do that all through Siri shortcuts. What I also found really interesting is that portrait mode on FaceTime also works through the Mac, even though it does not have any Face ID sensors or a true depth camera system. Pretty much all Macs are capped out at a 1080p webcam, usually worse, and they support portrait mode too, while you're FaceTiming, which is kind of interesting. But for the most
most part, other than the redesigned Safari and all the things I just listed, Mac OS Monterey doesn't seem like a huge update, so I wouldn't get too upset if your old Mac is not gonna get updated. I think that most of the changes feel pretty minor, and it's a fairly similar situation with Watch OS 8. There was not a ton of new features, a couple new activity options for Tai Chi. So if you wanna be more calm from all these disappointments, that should be helpful with that. We got one new watch face, which is for portrait mode, which I actually think this was pretty dang cool. If you take a portrait mode photo and set it as your watch face with the Apple Watch, it can put the time behind the subject because they have that 3D data. And that was pretty clever and I wasn't expecting it. So I'm impressed by the portrait mode thing. And I also like now that instead of when you wanna type and you have to decide between scribble or dictation, they've combined that whole screen so that it just goes straight to scribble. Or if you wanna do an emoji and dictation, there's little icons in the corner to activate. They're still redesigning the Breathe app. I don't know how many people are still using that thing, but it was hilarious to me that they have this mental wellness feature where essentially it tells you to think about something happy and then it gives you this random animation. And that was just hilarious to me. I couldn't stop laughing at the animation that just says, think about something happy for 60 seconds. Thanks, Apple Watch. This is this is really what I needed in my world. But the good news is everything that supported Watch OS 7 will also be supporting Watch OS 8. So you Series 3 owners, you'll be getting a whole nother year of support of the Breathe app. And also the Home app has been updated for Watch OS to let you look directly at your doorbell camera through HomeKit Secure Video. You can use the intercom feature through there. And the Photos app has been updated to allow you to have, I guess, more photos shown at the same time. And you can share those photos directly from the Photos app and text people through the Apple Watch. I don't think I'm ever going to do that, but you can. Plus, of course, all of those focus features that we talked about before were also going to be added to Watch OS 8 as well. The developer betas will be available today. Public beta, as usual, will be available next month. And the official release will be in the fall. So nothing really too out of the ordinary there. Siri is actually going to start working on third-party applications now. They brought up during the home section of the event. It's not home OS, but they talked about HomePods and Apple TV simultaneously. They mentioned that HomePod minis will be getting lossless audio support, but definitely no AirPods. I hate to say I told you so on that one, but we're not getting any lossless playback on AirPods anytime soon, at least. Now would have been a good time to announce it, and they didn't. And overall, the pace of the event felt a little slow to me. It was definitely more exciting last year. Even though there was no hardware at Quadruple UDC last year, it felt like the changes were a bit more noticeable and a bit more appreciated. You know, first time we had picture in picture on the iPhone, first time we had widgets on the home screen on the iPhone, but they weren't interactive. They still aren't interactive now, which is kind of annoying. And ultimately, as you guys know, I was mainly rooting for iPad OS to be the main star of the show. I didn't have many other requests for the other platforms. And the fact that it was basically the sleeper OS, it got the least amount of support. It got the least amount of attention, kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And yeah, on top of that, the fact that we didn't get M1X or any new hardware at all, that's a bit of a bummer. It means we got to wait a little bit longer before we see Apple Silicon faster than the M1. I'll get over it. Overall, I'm still interested in a lot of the changes. I think they're very welcome. And the fact that they're free is awesome. And the backwards compatibility of so many older Apple devices is fantastic. So overall, lots of good things to be happy for. But still, I think we got to blame the leakers in this case for getting us excited for things that were clearly not ready. And hopefully we can learn from that and apply it to our expectations moving forward. But I can say next Apple event in September, most definitely will have a hardware. At least I hope so. And I'm curious what your guys' biggest takeaways were from this event. What are you most excited for? What do you think was underrated during this whole keynote? All that good stuff. Let me know down in the comments below. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I'm disappointed. Bye.